So that takes me on to introduce Dr. David Boyd, our next speaker. Um, David is UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment um, uh, from 2014 uh, through going through until 2024. He's a Professor of Law, Policy and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia and also the author of 10 books and over 100 reports and articles on environmental law and policy, human rights and constitutional law. His books include First for Justice, published in 2020, the Rights of Nature in 2017, The Optimistic Environmentalist in 2015, and The Environmental Rights Revolution in 2012. David, it's a pleasure to welcome you, um, and I'll hand straight over to you to, to, to speak to us. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alice, and uh, good morning, everyone from Canada. Particularly great to see my friend, uh, Commissioner Dunja Mijatovic, and thank you for your kind words, Dunja, and thank you, more importantly, for the terrific work you're doing on human rights at the Council of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, for the past 10,000 years, our species has enjoyed a period of climatic stability known as the Holocene that enabled the emergence of agriculture, cities, and indeed civilization. But the Holocene is over now, replaced by the Anthropocene, as human activities have pushed global average temperatures out of the safe zone. Here on the west coast of Canada, where I live, we experienced an unimaginable heat wave this summer with temperatures reaching 50 degrees Celsius. This caused hundreds of deaths, wildfires that caused massive air pollution, and a heat wave. the heat wave killed an estimated 1 billion marine animals. The latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change confirms that we are living in a climate emergency with increasingly intense and frequent extreme weather events, floods, droughts, and rising sea levels. My key point here today is that the global climate crisis is also a human rights crisis. The rights to life, health, food, water, cultural rights, the rights of the child, and of course the right to a healthy environment are all being jeopardized and violated on a daily basis. The adverse impacts fall disproportionately upon the shoulders of poor, vulnerable, and marginalized populations, making it even more difficult for them to enjoy their basic human rights. And you know, uh, we already had a colleague speak about uh, the, the state of Kiribati in the South Pacific. As the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, I visited Fiji in 2019 on my first official UN mission. And I went to a village called Vunidongaloa, which is one of the first communities in the world that had to be completely relocated because of the impacts of climate change. It was once a waterfront paradise with palm trees and everything you would imagine in a beautiful country like Fiji. But because of rising sea levels, storm surges, and saltwater contamination of their agricultural lands and water supplies, they had to move inland by about three kilometers. Now older persons, young children, persons with disabilities, and pregnant women cannot walk the steep trail in the powerful heat and humidity, which separates them from the ocean that has sustained their people for centuries, with obvious implications for their rights. I also visited two informal settlements on the outskirts of Suva, the Fijian capital. Many of the people I met had lost their homes in tropical cyclone Winston in 2016 and were living in extremely rough conditions. One of these settlements was adjacent to a river, the other was right beside the ocean. Both were subject to routine flooding, again, exacerbated by climate change. And these floods forced excrement out of pit toilets, contaminating food and water, and leading to waterborne diseases, including a typhoid fever outbreak while I was in Fiji. It is crystal clear that the people of Fiji have almost zero responsibility in causing climate change, and yet they are bearing the costs of losing their homes, relocating and rebuilding their communities, rebuilding infrastructure. This is really the face of climate injustice in the 21st century. On other trips, I've met with pastoralists in Kenya, whose livestock has starved to death because of drought, pushing people further into extreme poverty. In Norway, I met with indigenous Sami people whose traditional culture based on reindeer herding is in jeopardy because of warm and erratic winter weather. So all of this is a backdrop to the fact that in 1992, almost 30 years ago, governments negotiated the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and pledged to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with the Earth's climate system. And I apologize for stating the obvious, but this commitment has not been met. 
Coal use, natural gas use, and oil use have all skyrocketed. Global greenhouse gas emissions have risen by almost 65% since 1992, and humanity is nowhere near achieving the emissions reductions needed to limit global warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees as committed in the Paris Agreement. The Achilles heel of international environmental law is a lack of compliance and enforcement mechanisms, which produces this lack of accountability. And that's where human rights have such a powerful role to play. We know from the events of recent centuries that human rights can be a catalyst for transformative changes in society. The abolitionists invoked freedom and equality in successfully ending slavery. Women, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement, and indigenous peoples have all used human rights as catalysts for societal transformation. It's never easy or instant, and human rights are by no means omnipotent, but history does prove that rights can be game changers. And one of the most powerful rights-based approaches in the context of the climate crisis is the right to a healthy environment, which as Dunya mentioned, was just recently recognized by the Human Rights Council just two and a half weeks ago. And the recognition of this right has already sparked transformative changes in some states from Costa Rica to France, where it's been part of their constitutional framework for some time. Academics and researchers have demonstrated that recognition of the right to a healthy environment is a catalyst for a number of important changes, including stronger environmental laws and policies, improved implementation and enforcement of those laws and policies, and higher levels of public participation in environmental decision making. But even more important is the conclusion that uh, is borne out by researchers that recognition of the right to a healthy environment causes improved environmental outcomes across a wide range of metrics, including faster reductions in air pollution, faster reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and higher levels of access to safe drinking water. Since adding the right to a healthy environment to their constitution in 1994, Costa Rica has reversed a decades-long process of deforestation, doubling forest cover from less than 25% to more than 50%. They've passed laws banning open pit mining and oil and gas development. They generate 99% of their electricity with wind, solar, geothermal, and hydroelectricity. In France, the right to a healthy environment was added to the constitution in 2004 and has been a catalyst for the world's first national law to ban fracking for natural gas, and more recently, a law that will prohibit oil and gas development across not only France, but all French territories. In Kenya, the right to a healthy environment was used to block a very ill-conceived coal-fired power plant on that country's east coast through a timely intervention of their national human rights institution. And one of the key elements of a rights-based approach to climate change is that there are these institutions and processes that can provide accountability. Litigation, of course, is a measure of last resort that's only relied upon when other options have been exhausted, but we are witnessing explosive growth in rights-based litigation because all options have been exhausted. So in countries including France, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, India, Pakistan, Colombia, Brazil, South Africa, Canada, and more, there are lawsuits alleging that governments are failing to take sufficient climate action to protect human rights, including the rights to life, health, and cultural rights. And courts in these cases are increasingly ordering governments to take more ambitious climate action, setting aside the approval of coal-fired power plants, overturning approvals of pipelines and other fossil fuel infrastructure, and ordering actions to stop deforestation. Early research indicates that these types of cases are more likely to succeed in states that recognize the right to a healthy environment. A few months ago, the Constitutional Court of Germany ordered the government uh, to take more ambitious climate action. And within weeks, the German government had agreed to cut emissions 65% by 2030 and accelerate their target for getting to net zero. In Colombia, 25 children and youth won a case at the Supreme Court that found their right to a healthy environment was being violated by deforestation in the Colombian portion of the Amazon. In Australia, a judge warned the government about the devastating impacts of further coal expansion on children's rights. And this trend towards increased litigation will continue until governments fulfill their human rights obligations and commitments. Courts have a legitimate role to play in upholding the rule of law, protecting human rights, 
and holding governments accountable. The recent recognition by the UN, UN Human Rights Council of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is a historic moment. And although these types of UN resolutions are not legally binding, this resolution will be a catalyst for more ambitious action, not only on climate, but on all environmental issues at the national level. And we can look back at the 2010 UN resolution on the rights to water and sanitation to see what kind of impacts these resolutions have. A number of countries, including Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, Slovenia, and Tunisia, added the right to water to their constitutions. Other countries, such as Colombia and France, added the right to water to their legislation. And most importantly, countries have accelerated efforts to deliver on this fundamental human right. Mexico has extended safe drinking water to more than 1,000 rural communities in the past decade. Slovenia has prioritized safe drinking water for Roma communities living in informal settlements. And here in Canada, the federal government has worked with Indigenous communities to bring safe drinking water to more than 115 Indigenous communities that suffered, in some cases, for decades without access to safe drinking water. So the bottom line, my friends, is this, that human rights must be at the heart of all climate action, mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. And we have to recognize that this is not an option for governments. These are human rights obligations. Thank you very much. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, David. You started out by sketching some very bleak pictures, but you've, you've given a very inspiring and motivational talk there that gets us thinking about the solutions. And, and you know, that talk's made me feel optimistic, um, uh, not, not just worried. Um, and, and I think both you and Dunya um, re have really drawn attention to the incredibly collective efforts that are required by so many different actors in society to drive this kind of change. Um, academia is clearly in the process of being under critical review by the public in many parts of the world. We're rightfully critiqued for being too elitist in our language and public relations with the very people we need to engage with. And we've got unaddressed ties to colonialism and white supremacy um, and, and so on, which delegitimize our position as an ethical sector of knowledge production we're also heavily commodified so the question given that context is how do you reconcile that the sort of essentially the PR problem that academia potentially has with academia's role in fighting disinformation well <laughs> it's a very difficult question I would say you know it's also difficult for me to to um, give uh, the right answer because if I have this answer, I think you know that would be quite uh, extraordinary. Uh, it is um, part of, of um, you know democratic discourse and uh, part of, of uh, uh, really reaching out. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to you know the work I do and uh, the situation where you have. Um, misinformation present, uh, skepticism, prejudice, you know, uh, propaganda uh, fueling the society, um, reaching out and talking to people and being more approachable uh, is, is a way to, to, to deal with many of the things, including uh, when it comes to skepticism in relation to some uh, issues that were mentioned in this uh, uh, question, if, if you... Uh, uh, can you know really see it as a, as a question? It is a more a statement of the current uh, challenges academia and our societies are facing. So this is uh, also a two-way two road. It's not only up to academia; it's up to all of us uh, to try to find the right. I'm not sure if it is balanced, but the right way. Uh, uh, how to deal with this. This in no way means that academia, because of this, should be excluded. On the contrary, I think it should be more present in, uh, um, you know, international settings in particular, but also nationals, in all discussions, in all uh, possible events uh, that uh, uh, we have. But now after I cannot even say after pandemic, but on the way out of this pandemic um, time, uh, it is even more important uh, to find the ways and to, to really engage uh, with academia. So from our side, from the side of international organizations, uh, because I think it makes uh, not just a sense, it makes it more powerful 
to talk about problems that are affecting our rights. Uh, so yeah, that's how I uh, see it. But uh, as I said, no um, spectacularly uh, uh, clever uh, reply that I can give on this, apart from you know really calling for vo more engagement. Thank you. I might bring David in in a second, but before I do, another participant has actually popped a potential answer in in the chat along with a question. So Stephanie Huff. Huff is grateful for, for this session. As an entry-level postdoctoral researcher and interested in using digital storytelling as a research method um, to engage the general public and better translate research into relatable and relevant content. But her question is, uh, um, how can a younger generation of researchers bring in innovative methods while negotiating the traditional methods and values um, of academia? So it's, it's that sort of, uh, it's that balancing act, I guess, between uh, uh, reaching out public engagement um, while also trying to survive in academia. David, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that or about the uh, about what, what Dunya was saying in response to the first question. One thing I think is that as a senior research, as senior researchers, which many of us on this uh, event are, we have a responsibility to make space for younger colleagues that are doing these innovative types of research in a type, in a, you know, digital storytelling is fantastic. It should count as full, it should get full credit towards people being tenured and promoted in their institution. So I think that's one thing. Another thing which we haven't, which Dunya and I haven't mentioned, which I think is really important in this discussion, uh, part of the question was about disinformation. And my colleague, Marcos Oriana, who is the special rapporteur on toxics and human rights, just published a phenomenal report on the right to science, which we don't talk about a lot, but the right to science is a really important human right, which can be used as a tool to combat disinformation. So I think that I would really recommend people take a look at that. Um, so yeah, those were my thoughts on those questions. Yes, the right to science sounds like really something to dig into. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a connected question here um, from Robin uh, uh, Perutz. Um, and and I, I think I'll ask both of you to respond to this one. It, it chimes with something that I've been thinking about, particularly after hearing David talking, um, which is um, how do you bring together um, campaigners and academics? How do you bring together environmental lawyers and scientists? We do tend, um, for all sorts of reasons, to work in our sectors, to work in our silos. Um, have you come across successful mechanisms for uh, crossing these divides and, 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 and bringing these people together into powerful collectives? Yeah, uh, let me just jump in straight into that question because you know the, the, this recent resolution from the UN Human Rights Council was the product of an incredible collaboration by thousands of people around the world. And so, you know, there was a civil society coalition that issued a global call for recognition that had over 1300 civil society organizations and did indigenous peoples organizations from around the world. We had letters from scientists. We had uh, a letter from over 50 of the world's leading businesses. We had a joint statement from over 50 special rapporteurs. And so it was really the coming together of all of those different sectors with one voice speaking very clearly with a clear set of demands that enabled this historic moment to actually happen. You know, it was very much a David and Goliath struggle uh, with large, powerful nations such as Russia and the United States opposing it every step of the way. But, you know, with, because of this broad civil society coalition, because of this connections to business and academia, we were able to uh, push it over, push it over the finish line, which was quite remarkable. And, and Dunya, I don't know if you want to come in on that, but but perhaps also to reflect a little bit on on the people who inevitably potentially are marginalised from that kind of collective because of the dangers that they may face in speaking up about certain issues. Uh, um, you talked a little bit about that in your speech and, and and some of the ways in which we might address them, but they're still they're still very present dangers. Mm. Um, just on, 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 on the first issue on how you make sure that uh, uh, all um, stakeholders are included. Uh, th this uh, example uh, that David used is just a perfect example. But what we have uh, now at the Council of Europe, uh, 8 to 10 December, we have a World Forum um, for Democracy um, with the title, Can Democracy Save the Environment? And in this, um, you know, event, uh, which is happening uh, for, for, you know, one or three days, actually, 
uh, you of course bring civil society, you bring academia, you, you bring uh, different uh, interlocutors, including businesses, which is also important and we should not forget about this, particularly if we talk about the environment. But when it comes to threats, as I stated, I, I decided to really focus on, on uh, working with human rights defenders defending environment, particularly because of this reason how to uh, reach out to them and how to make them more powerful in uh, not just uh, sharing their experience, but reaching out to explain uh, what happened to them. And what I can say uh, when it comes to trust uh, in talking to uh, my office uh, uh, and me personally, that's not an issue because we have a long standing uh, experience and legacy uh, in talking to activists, human rights defenders in the most uh, difficult environments um, and states uh, in order to make sure that the mandate is used in the right way to remind the governments uh, not to be uh, engaging in such uh, actions. Unfortunately, uh, this is not a case. Uh, and uh, as we speak, there are situations where um, not just uh, uh, human rights defenders, but also journalists uh, reporting about these um, events uh, and uh, members of uh, the society are also very much affected. Uh, so I think this is uh, important to recognize as a real threat, uh, as a threat to their rights uh, in order to be more visible and more um, active on this, and this is already happening uh, at the different international organizations, including uh, the UN and uh, uh, some, some, some other organizations. How to overcome these problems, uh, it will, um, you know, the time will tell, but I think the attention and also uh, the fact that more and more young people are demanding uh, changes is this is also going to help. It, it is more exposed, it is more visible, and then it is also uh, more easy to, to tackle it. In my country visits, um, each and every time uh, now, uh, I try to tackle this issue, also to meet with people, which is extremely important, and talk to them in order to be able to uh, really not just put the right words on, on, on paper, but actually to take actions in talking to the governments and also uh, giving voice to the ones that are uh, silenced. And uh, unfortunately, there are too many uh, like this. Thank you. So, so visibility and again, collective action um, help to create momentum. Um, I think we've got time just for one more question. So what I'm going to do is compress two in the chat. So uh, um, there's one question uh, um, about uh, um, uh, what, so now that the right to a healthy environment has been recognized, what difference might that actually make? Um, and and a, a sort of related question, which is again, you know, following the recent UN resolution, um, what do you see as the barriers or sticking points for change? So maybe we can come to David and, and then Dunya um, for a final word. R Right. Well, I think, you know, as I mentioned in my in my talk, the, the critical part about the recognition of the right to a healthy environment by, by the UN, it, it, that's not a legally binding or enforceable resolution, but it is a catalyst for change at the national level. So I anticipate that we'll, we will see uh, additional countries adding the right to a healthy environment to their constitutions, which is of superordinate importance because those are the highest and strongest laws of any country. We will see countries adding it to their environmental legislation, which is important for the implementation process. And most importantly, I think we'll see citizens around the, the world, environmental human rights defenders, women, indigenous peoples, using this right as a tool to advance their human rights, to advance their interests in not only a safe and stable climate, but also clean air, healthy and, healthy and ecosystems and biodiversity healthy and sustainably produced food, safe drinking water, and non-toxic environments where people can live, work, study, and play. So it really is a, a game-changing solution. We're already starting to see impacts at the meeting of the parties to the Aarhus Convention that Dunya mentioned in her speech. There, were, there was a declaration put forward about uh, some of these issues, which included specific references to that right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. 
And I think that it's critically important as we now enter the COP26 that people really focus on this rights-based approach to climate change. Human rights should be at the center of every nationally de determined contribution. They should be at the center of every long-term decarbonization plan. They should be at the center of all climate actions, mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. And that's really our best hope for having effective and equitable outcomes in this monumental challenge that we as human beings are facing. Thank you. Dunya, do you want to do, do you want to add anything to that? Just uh, uh, to say, yes, it is not legally binding, uh, but uh, I think it is extremely powerful and important message, uh, a tool uh, that all of us can use in our work um, in order to, to really uh, explain the importance of, 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 of this. Uh, I think it will be used by many governments that uh, David mentioned that are at the forefront on fighting uh, uh, for a free environment. It will be used, of course, by academia uh, and also by young activists, which I think uh, is of uh, extreme importance. So they can also be a very powerful uh, preachers of, of uh, the importance of uh, this document. And uh, I'm sure that uh, both David and I will be joining them uh, and many others of our colleagues uh, in order really to see a rapid uh, and true change. Because I think we are very good in producing documents and uh, making uh, um, our voices heard also in the international forum. But we need action. The time now is for real action, uh, because if this does not happen, um, we can really, um, you know, be in a very, very difficult situation. And it will come back uh, at us as a boomerang, uh, which is already happening in, in many parts of the world. Thank you. Well, I, I think that is a good note uh, on which actually to thank both of you. Commissioner Dunja Mitava uh, Mijatovic and um, Dr. David Boyd, not just for kickstarting um, uh, the, the afternoon set of talks with really inspiring and informative discussions, but also for all the work you have done in your careers, um, getting us to this point um, where we're you know, able to talk about this new resolution.